Hello everyone, uh, this week I'm joined by the wonderful Hannah Oliver Byrne of Combined Physio. Hello Hannah. Hi, how are you? How are you? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> doing very well, thank you very much. We were just talking about you uh, having a busy day. Yeah, super busy day. <laughs> well, thank you very much for giving up your evening to chat to us like this. It's really My kind pleasure. of you. Thanks. So, uh, Hannah not only treats one species, two species, three species. I mean, that's really unusual, isn't it, Hannah? Uh, it's quite unusual, um, and technically, it's probably more than three. It's probably more. It's probably more like four on really? a regular basis. Okay, can you name them off the top of your head? Well, <laughs> humans, yeah. number one. Yeah. <laughs> Horses. Uh -huh. Dogs and cats. Fantastic. And yeah. do you find that one kind of feeds into the other? or? Yeah, definitely. The skill sets are uh, very similar mm -hmm. in what you need for treating the different species. Mm -hmm. um, you just end up going about it a little bit of a different way depending on what you're treating and what you're assessing. And how much somebody can tell you what's wrong compared to an animal that can't tell you in the same way. Yeah, we all know that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favourite? Um, people always ask me this, and <laughs> I really like the mix that I have because oh, okay. I I treat um, most days of the week, bar a Sunday, um, and it's sort of humans one day a week solidly. Mm -hmm. My clean day, I like to call it, where mm. I uh, don't get covered in slobber or hair or <laughs> anything else. I don't know. I, I've met some humans in my time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the rest of the week uh, is more animal focused, so split between the horses, the dogs, and then the odd cat. And I do, I don't see that many cats, but I would say that they're definitely the most challenging. They're the most oh, really? fun to treat. Yeah. Why is that? Um, they have a, a lot lower tolerance threshold mm. than anything else. Yeah. So you have to be much quicker with how you deal with them. Yes. And it's much more on their terms. Mm. Um, because unlike you being a vet, I don't get to sedate or use extra drugs yes. to make my animals <laughs> do what I want them to. Yeah. I have to coerce them <laughs> a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, we, we can cheat sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Funny you say that because I, I really like operating on cats because they have such clean bones and they're generally, um, I don't know, anatomically, they're, they're, they're just easier to kind of manipulate their joints and, you know, it's easier to find stuff on them. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, excellent. So, Combined Physio, um, this is your business? It is. How long have you been open for now? Uh, it's five years this month that really? it's uh, been open and running. Fantastic. I know, you know, we send lots of cases over to you and we've had some brilliant reports back. What, what made you start it up? Were, were you working at another place before that or was it straight from um, college? Or? So I was primarily uh, people-based before that mm -hmm. and decided that I wanted to branch out into animal physiotherapy mm -hmm. because it was a bit of a passion of mine. Right. So I did a part-time master's degree in veterinary physiotherapy. Where was that? And that was at Hartbury. Um, at the time, it was a collaboration between Hartbury and the University of the West of England. Nice. Um, and I did that whilst working full time, treating people still. Blimey. Um, which gave me the the real skill set to to then transfer across and do my own business with the animals. Mm. And that's when I started working with vets like you and Fantastic. others in the local area. Yeah. How far, what sort of uh, area do you cover? Small animal wise, um, I cover between Leamington Spa, Banbury, but into Northamptonshire, mm. Oxfordshire, Warwickshire basically. Um, my furthest north is probably Coventry that mm. refer into me. Right, okie dokie. So, uh, and is it all private nice work that you do or do you do NHS yeah. work? Um, all the animals are right. private work obviously. Yeah. Um, and humans, and humans is, is just private work now. I did do a, quite a bit of NHS work before, right. um, uh, but not anymore. I've just narrowed it down to those lucky few humans that are left. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, what are the kind of cases that you see coming through to you? I mean, I, I'm most familiar with referring cases over to you, you know, 
post-operative case and I'd like to talk about that a little bit later on if that's okay yeah. but you know do you have people just turning up at your door as well you know if we can just talk about just the animal side of things for a while um, what sort of stuff do you have coming through the door and what kind of things can you do there well I have a, a real mix um, from the small animal point of view mm-hmm. um, I get a mix between your elderly patient with arthritic joints um, to um, younger dogs that maybe are struggling with hip dysplasia or elbow dysplasia, mm. um, post-operative cases such as after cruise ship repairs, spinal surgery, fracture repairs, um, and then your more neurological cases that aren't operative such as your disc disease or mm. um, your chronic um, neuro- neuro- logical problems that are, are mostly degenerative or I have one little dog that I treat on a semi-regular basis that has cerebellar ataxia for example right okay. which is an interesting case so it's about supporting those cases that are more degenerative mm-hmm. um, or long-term chronic conditions and keeping their quality of life as good as possible mm-hmm. and as functional as possible mm-hmm. um, or with your post-operative cases or your after sports injury cases, such as agility dogs, mm-hmm. you'd be getting them back to full fitness and then letting them go, sort of thing. So it just really depends on the kind of cases that I'm treating. Right. Okay. Okay. And what what kind of stuff can you can you do up there? You know, obviously you've got the man. I think we all think of physios and we think of sort of manipulation, but yeah. you know, what kind of you know? It's, it's obviously far more than that. What else have, yeah. have you got up there? So um, at both um, the clinics that I have in Lamington and Banbury, I have hydrotherapy facilities. Mm -hmm. So at the one I have an underwater, both I have an underwater treadmill and one I have a pool as well. Mm -hmm. And that can be really useful from a strength and conditioning point of view. Mm -hmm. Um, You can go quite gentle with those cases that are fairly early Mm -hmm. post-operatively, giving them lots of support with a high level of water Mm -hmm. and allowing the water to just massage around those limbs and support the joints and the weight bearing through them mm-hmm. while strengthening the muscles. Mm-hmm. And then uh, aside from hydrotherapy, um, I have uh, a lovely machine called a uh, laser machine, which is a low level laser therapy, mm-hmm. uh, really, really useful for pain relief, mm-hmm. for um, increasing the, the healing rate of Mm-hmm. Um, wounds and joints that have been operated on, etc. Mm-hmm. And for muscle knots and muscle tensions as well can be really useful. Okay. Um, massage is a key part of what I do um, in promoting blood flow and healing and, and releasing muscle tension, particularly after muscle strain or if an animal's been compensating for a while because of a problem. Mm-hmm. Maybe they haven't been using their limb for a little while. Mm-hmm can really help with that sort of thing and joint mobilizing and manipulation as well on a gentle level to try and encourage that normal joint movement to to come back again excellent okay loads of stuff to do (coughs) i mean one of the questions i often get asked uh if i'm talking about hydro is what's the difference between hydro with you and you know someone going out to a reservoir and just you know throw it throwing a ball in the lake and see how it goes (laughs) Well, um, the temperature of the water is um, a, a key thing. We use temperatures around 26 to 29 degrees Celsius. Okay. Which has been shown to not make the animal work any harder mm-hmm. than absolutely necessary to maintain their body temperature. Mm. So, <coughs> I have to excuse me. Um, <laughs> So uh, they get the benefit of the heated water for their joints from a pain relief point of view and from their muscles point of view Mm -hmm. without having to work extra hard just to maintain their body temperature, which is what we see often when dogs, um, especially are swimming in open water such as rivers, lakes, um, is that they're having to work extra hard to keep their body temperature up as well and they're not getting the benefits of the warmer water. Mm Safety is another thing. Um, mm. When they're going into rivers, you, know, you just don't know what's on the bed of the river. Mm. Might be sharp stones, bits of glass, you just don't know. You're putting that at risk a little bit. 
Mm-hmm. Although the dog may think, oh, this is great, this is outside, and they love swimming anyway, you haven't got the control that you have mm-hmm. in the hydrotherapy tank or pool that we provide. <coughs> I know. Um, I ought to say as well, you've been, you've been a bit ill recently, haven't you, Hannah? I and, have. Yeah, so, so again, stopping. not only a busy day, but also ill as well. You still turned out. Thank you. I um I I remember uh, many years ago operating on a senior partner's dog uh, back at a practice I used to work at and um, it had a he had a patella problem uh, operated on it and uh, I advised him to go for hydrotherapy but he was very much one of the old guard and one of my clients reported seeing him in the local river standing on a bridge with with something like a, a fish a, a clothesline going around to the dog and the dog work. but actually um that dog didn't do as well as we were hoping because it was too much too soon i think having that whole plan that you guys come up with is, is a really important thing yeah we're very graded in our approach so um you start off gently and and monitoring the entire time how the animal is using the affected limb, for example, mm-hmm. um, because very often, especially post-operatively, they won't want to pick up that limb and step it forward as much as the other one, or they may compensate a lot more through the other limbs, even mm-hmm. in water. Mm-hmm. And when they're on their own terms, in a river or a lake or something, they'll just carry on compensating mm-hmm. and won't build the muscle and the joint movement on that limb that we need them to do post-operatively. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm always very keen on on getting physio going as soon as I can after uh, orthopedic operations. I guess. Um, yeah. When do you generally recommend? I mean, does it vary from procedure to procedure? Or in an ideal world, and where the evidence based is in all the um, uh, research papers that have been done, um, it's about ten days postoperatively. So as soon as the stitches are um, removed if they're removable stitches. Mm. As soon as the wound's done that initial healing stage, you then want to get them hydrotherapy as soon as you can to start building that muscle, getting them using the limb, mm. um, and back to normal ASAP. And do you have any uh, figures to hand? Sorry, I'm dropping this on you a, a bit um, about the comparison between the dogs that have physio post op and the dogs that don't have physio post op. Um, I don't have any figures, figures, figures to hand, mm. but um, we know that the ones that have physio post-op normally get back to a normal level of function about 50 to 60% quicker than wow. the ones that don't. Wow. So it's quite a big difference. That, that's amazing. Yeah, I didn't realise it was quite that much. Yeah, and, and the evidence, the majority of that evidence has come from post-cruciate repair mm. where... Obviously, that's been done a lot in a lot of different cases, a lot of different dogs. Mm. Um, and so that's our best evidence, really. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think it's an absolutely critical part of um, of uh, the post-operative re- recovery process. Um, and, and one thing that I always advise people now is if you're insuring your dog... J- see if physiotherapy is included as part of the package um, as well. Absolutely. Think... And most insurers do cover it um, as part of the, the bigger vet's fees package. So right. they understand that physiotherapy, the rehabilitation, is definitely part of the mm. operation. Yeah, absolutely. It's not a complementary therapy. It's very much important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <coughs> and do you, do you think there's much difference between... Uh, you, do you've got the treadmill, you say, there. Do you think there's... Uh, is there a, an indication for treadmills over swimming? Absolutely. Um, particularly post-operatively, you have a dog that is not walking properly on that limb. That's mm. the, the crux of it. And so when a dog is swimming, it's using completely different muscles to the ones that it uses when it's walking. Mm-hmm. So on a treadmill, you get the perfect scenario underwater where they're walking, so they're weight-bearing to mm. whatever level you can prescribe within that setting, mm. but they're still having the water benefits, the water resistance for strengthening. Right. Strengthening the correct muscles for weight-bearing so that that limb recovers back to function. A, a lot of dogs don't swim to get around, they walk. So <laughs> it's quite a big difference. <laughs> Having got lurchers, I, I can fully appreciate getting them swimming would be a nightmare. Yeah. Um, 
And I suppose this is all about uh, coordination as well, like neuromuscular coordination yeah. of movement, which feeds into what you're saying there with the neurological rehabilitation. Yeah, absolutely. From a, a neurological case point of view, again, if you're trying to get them functioning ASAP, um, for example, they've had um, uh, an episode where they've become paralyzed or they're completely unable to use their hind limbs, Mm -hmm. some evidence, some really quite good evidence that suggests that as soon as you can get them walking again, even if that's with a lot of support and an underwater treadmill is great for that because you can be in there, the water's helping to buoyancy them up, Mm -hmm. you can be in there helping them walk again and the sooner they're doing that and the more frequently they're doing that at the early stages, again, the quicker they get back to walking Mm -hmm. again on on their own steam. And we're not, you know, where we used to be, where if a dog went off their back legs, it was sort of, okay, well, there's not much we can do. Now we can get them back to being fully functioning again Mm. with correct rehab. And an underwater treadmill is a great scenario to do that in. Yeah. I think it's something that uh, the veterinary profession is is getting better at understanding that that you know the brain, the central nervous system, it's plastic. You've got this neuroplasticity and yeah. training it to to root round problems. Absolutely, um, and you know the, the perfect situation. Uh, they did a, a study on um, cats where they uh, cut through the spinal cord. So they train them to go on an underwater treadmill, and they mm. cut through the spinal cord, ethically mm. questionable, yeah. and then they put them back on the treadmill, and they could walk again because they'd already learned through their what we call central pattern generators in their spinal cord, not just through their brain, to to walk on the treadmill. And as even though there was one level of the spinal cord that was affected it could reroute around that and still communicate with the brain to get that normal walking function back again. Wow. Amazing. Yeah, amazing. Oh, okay, um, you, you mentioned you've got a, um, a laser as well there. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, I've certainly heard of K lasers and I believe there are different grades of it as well. And, you know, we uh-huh. have we have lots of marketing material coming through the door, ad- advertising the benefits of you know class three versus class four and all this sort of thing more numbers isn't always better though i think no absolutely um and i uh i decided to focus my masters on um laser for dogs Mm -hmm. um and so i i like to think that i you know I, i really got my head around that sort of physics stuff right um between the 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 class three laser and the class four laser um, is is class, one more powerful than the other? Is that is that yes, or so different frequency? In theory, the class four laser is um, higher wattage. Right, like, so more and, powerful. And that's what makes it a class four. And and it's specified um, quite specifically from a safety point of view in this country mm-hmm. because the class fours um, come with more of a risk. Mm-hmm. So more of a risk of burning mm-hmm. and um, of, of more of a risk to your eyes as well. Mm-hmm. Whereas the class three is um, safer because it's lower wattage, lower mm. power. Um, but you can be more specific with the class three. So although you've got more power, it's not necessarily the best thing. With mm. the class fours, they need to have more power, but they can't always have the wavelength that penetrates to the depth that you want it to. Yeah. So most of the lasers, including the K laser, doesn't penetrate to the depth that we need it to. Mm-hmm to get to most tissues Mm. and with the class fours you have to move the probe around because if you hold it still you're likely to burn the animal and that comes um, with a problem because all the research that's good robust evident is behind Mm. calculating dose of a probe that you can stay still. Right. Oh, okay. the, the three B's have much better evidence because you hold it still, you can know the penetration you're getting, you know mm. the what the power you're getting, mm. and then you know the frequency you can set it at. Whereas you can't do that with the class fours to anywhere near the same extent. I mean, I, I, I've got visions, and I'm sure everyone else has, of you wielding these lasers like lightsabers around yeah. the place. But I'm guessing... 
that the the idea of them is to develop is to pinpoint heating um either within the skin under the skin to improve healing rates is, is that what no. you're looking to ah okay no so that's where the class four has a heating effect. That's right. why it, it can burn mm -hmm. because of the level of power that it has. So with mm -hmm. any high energy device, you're going to get a heat effect as a byproduct. Right. With the 3B, the lower level laser, what we call the cold laser, mm -hmm. you don't have a heating effect. The okay. effect is due to the light. Right, okay. We all know that plants and we photosynthesize we do stuff with extra light we don't mm. do as well when the weather's not so good particularly if we're in colder countries like the UK yeah, yeah. we know that we do better when we're able to get more light in there and that's basically the principle mm. of laser so if you're getting um, a laser with the correct um, wavelength that penetrates the depth you want you're mm. having an effect on the cells with light. That's all it is really, but we know that then that light has an effect on promoting healing by about 50%, mm -hmm. increasing blood flow, reducing swelling, mm -hmm. and pain relief as well. Okay, excellent. And what kind of injuries do you tend to use it for? Or, or you know, rehabilitation? Do you tend I use it a, a lot for lots of different things. So, for example, your, your hip, dysplasia, elbow dysplasia type cases. Mm -hmm. I use it for pain relief and to encourage blood flow and reduce um, swelling at the joints that are a problem. Mm -hmm. I also use it over acupuncture points mm -hmm. because acupuncture has been shown to work very similarly to laser over those same acupuncture points, mm -hmm. which is great for those dogs that don't tolerate acupuncture very well, but mm -hmm. they can't feel the 3B laser, so you're still getting a good effect. Mm -hmm which is having an effect on pain relief for the limb, for example. Mm. So for your hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia, that's how I use it. For your um, post-operative cases, using it for some of the wound healing and to reduce scar tissue, it's very good for that. We know mm. that from the research. For pain relief and encouraging swelling to go down. And then also for helping those muscles recover as well. And from a neurological um, condition point of view, we know that laser at the correct dose over spinal cord injury speeds up their time to ambulation to that back to walking again by 50%. Wow, wow, so amazing. Really, really great for, for using it for all of those different things. Is, and is there a limit to the sort of penetration depth? Yeah, the limits um, are around about three to four centimeters that we're aware of at the moment, depending okay. on the power, but the the wavelength that we know is, is best is about 810 nanometers, and that is getting to your three, four centimeters depth. Right. Um, so for your small animal, you're getting to joints with that level. Yeah, yeah. Not so much with a horse's hip, for example, <laughs> <laughs> but, but certainly for your small animal, we're getting to the joints that we want to. Yeah, oh, brilliant. And I know I was speaking to you a few days ago about... Um, stem cells, I, I believe that there's now work uh, with coal lasers to activate yeah. these stem cells. Definitely, it seems to be that stem cells um, together with laser have a better effect on stimulating the healing processes than just stem cells on itself or laser on itself. So um, I've done some work with um, some other vets and I know that you're about to start using stem cells a lot more. Yeah. Um, and the, and the results that we've had with the other vets have been quite promising mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in getting the, the tendons especially um, and, and joint disease um, doing a lot better and then the, the dog gets back to normal function basically. Yeah, okay. And how about sort of um, sporting dogs as well? You know, uh, recovery, yeah. uh, do you use it in tendinopathies? Uh, yeah, so strain, sprays, yeah, that sort of definitely. thing. Definitely, um, and the evidence um, uh, for tendinopathies is much more coming from work with horses' tendons and human tendons, like Achilles. Mm -hmm. So we know that the the effect of laser on tendon healing is even better than ultrasound mm -hmm. and other modalities in speeding up that tendon healing. Mm -hmm. So. You know, we see in sporting dogs a lot of the time they're getting um, tendon injuries uh, um, in their shoulder and in their hip because of 
what we're asking them to do with repetitive motions such as agility, you know, doing the dog walk, doing seesaw, it puts a lot of pressure um, down through their shoulders and through their hips. And um, laser really helps to help them recover post tendinopathy, tendon problems there, mm -hmm. and back to normal um, speeds and function again. Yeah. So, what would you say to uh, a client that, that came in to see me and I was talking to them about physio? Uh, maybe it's a post operative case or it's a case like elbow dysplasia or hip dysplasia. What would be your sort of, I guess, how would you explain the benefits? What, what are the, what are the, the headline numbers and, and facts here for physio? The, the headline facts for physio. Um, uh, well, just to repeat again, you're getting pain relief. You're getting a restoration of normal movement. Mm -hmm. You're getting reduction in um, swelling and increased healing rate and a return to function and fitness much quicker mm. um, than without the rehabilitation. And it's really important to me that I work very closely with all the vets that refer to me because it's a constant balance between um, medication, surgical intervention, and rehabilitation. And you can't do it on your own as a physio or as a a vet I don't think you need the full team approach which supports the animal in the best way yeah you definitely don't get the optimal outcome if, if you're not working as part of a team no you know you know the, the things that you can offer off I find reduces the amount of say non-steroidal painkillers anti-inflammatories that we have yeah. to use with all the side effects that they carry you know I try yeah. and move away from from drug therapy as much as we can absolutely work, try and um, work with the body yeah, and and as useful as non-steroidals and steroidal anti-inflammatories can be in certain cases, a lot of dogs don't tolerate them very well because of other conditions that they may have, um, or they have side effects with it. And everything that we do in physiotherapy has no real side effect. Mm. So you're getting the benefit of anti-inflammatory action, mm -hmm. pain relief, without any of that side effects, particularly with those dogs that are intolerant to them. And we know, again, from the research that non steroidal anti-inflammatories and laser are as good as each other. Yeah. So if you, can, if, if you can't do the non steroidals you can use other things within physiotherapy that will do the same job without side effects. Fantastic. Um, have I missed anything about physiotherapy? Um, I think, in general, we've covered most aspects. We have covered a lot this evening. <laughs> I've, I've learned loads. And I've, okay. worked with you, I've, learned, I've worked with you for years, and I felt like tonight I've, I've learned an awful lot. <laughs> oh, that's so refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you know, from my point of view, like a, you know, just to emphasise, working with you, I find the results that we, we get from, you know, like you say, surgical, medical and physiotherapy, physiotherapy interventions, just much better. It's a much better way of doing things. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's also um, important to, to say that I'm obviously talking about my own experience and my business and the research that I've read. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of great other rehab professionals out there, but it's making sure also, as a client point of view, that you know who you're working with from an animal point of view because mm. there's no regulation for um, the general physiotherapist that's working with animals. Anybody can call themselves a dog physio, for example. Right. It's very important that you do your research on whoever you use. Is there a protected term? Is there a veterinary physiotherapist? No. No, <laughs> is there not? No, so only mm. physiotherapist on its own mm. um, is protected. Right. But anybody can call themselves a dog physio or a cat physio or an animal physio really? without having done any training at all. So you have to be really careful. Um, and, and the more that people are just aware of that so that they can do their due diligence, make sure that the person that's looking after their animal 
is qualified to do so. So what, what are the letters that we're looking for after people's names? What are the qualifications we're looking so for? So ideally, um, you're looking for the Association of Chartered Physios and Animal Therapy, so ACPAT, ACPAT. Um, from a physiotherapist point of view, mm -hmm. or RAMP, um, which is the Register of Animal Musculoskeletal Practitioners. Okay. And they have a standard level of training for all the people on their register. Mm -hmm. And they all have had to have done a thousand hours of training and a bare minimum to do what they do. Right. Okay. And uh, 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 are they generally human physios that have gone on and done extra qualifications? Or? All, all ACPAT physios are human physios that have gone on to do postgraduate diploma to masters in veterinary physiotherapy. Right. And so uh, all have... And do you have a red, is there a register available online to check people? Up yes, you can literally go on to the ACPAT website and put your postcode in find a physio and yeah. then you'll find all the people that are properly registered in your area. Okay, and do you take, um, ref you take referrals from, from us, do you take referrals from other places or first opinion work as well? Um, so I take referrals from um, all, all sorts of vets, whether they're hospitals or their primary care centres like yourself mm. and um, we can't work without veterinary consent it's illegal for anybody to treat an animal without veterinary consent mm -hmm. um, because it's because it's not a regulated profession so the um, the vets want to make sure that they're referring to appropriately qualified physiotherapists great well, that, that was fantastic. I, it's been a great chat this evening. Hannah. Good. I can't thank you enough for turning up after, like I say, a busy day, ill, amazing. Oh, I'm getting there. But thank you so much for taking the time to do this with me and oh, for your client. Really, 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 really good. good. Okay. Well, uh, right. no doubt I'll speak to you soon, but uh, thanks very thank much you. and uh, good night. Bye. Bye, Bye Hannah.